I'm going to be talking about something that I've been very, we all been very involved with, Nigel, in the past uh, two and a half years. And that is the COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma Project. And I will tell you, I think that this is the most important thing I've ever been involved in. I want to begin with talk, the talk of Bill. Uh, in 1831, he traveled through America and he made a lot of observations. And one of the things that struck him most was that in the United States, he could see all sorts of associations that came together to do things. And this was, had no precedent in Europe where you relied on the, on the king, the government to do so. And what I'm gonna tell you is that we can, in our society, we can't, we can't do anything about guns. We can't do anything about a lot of things but we can still get together and get things done. And that is uh, priceless. So uh, go back to January of 2019, uh, the, I was watching the situation with a lot of concern. This was before we ever got together in any way. And people were writing all kinds of stuff, but there was no mention about plasma therapy. And I knew about this and I knew the history. They were talking monoclonals, antivirals, vaccines. And the question was, how do you get the word out? Well, I could have put it in a medical journal, but no one was going to see it. So I decided to try an op-ed. I tried the New York Times, the Washington Post, Bloomberg. Nobody wanted it. But like everything in life, you said everything is luck. So I sent it to the Wall Street Journal on the day where the market tanked and they took it. And this was really important because I had a link that I could then send around. And I basically talked about a, uh, a, a pediatric outbreak in this school. Roswell Gallagher was a school doctor and he went on to a uh, distinguished career in adolescent medicine. The bottom line was that you take serum from the individual who recovered and they were able to stop the outbreak. So with that link, I began to send it to all my friends. And one of my friends was Mike Joyner, who as he pointed out, we had connected over our concerns about problems in medicine. In fact, we had met in 2016 in Boston and continued to call. And this was his email. And what Mike realized right away, and I didn't know about it because he's an anesthesiologist and he's always hanging blood products, is that there was a tremendous capacity in the country that this could be done at scale. And, um, and that is the email. So we all began to organize and mobilize. So uh, in March, 2020, a lot of things happened and the CCP-19, by the way, that stands for, for COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma. We put the 19 in the end. I like the C's. It reminded me of CCCP that I grew up in Cuba with, was in the old Soviet Union. So we took that and you can see the timeline. Of, so the, the Wall Street op-ed is at the end of February. Send it to all my friends. We organized largely by email. Hopkins organized a team that will go on to do a lot, a lot of things. I connected with another friend of mine, Lizzie Amparowski, and we wrote a paper on this because it needed to be a document. And by the middle of the month, we had formed the Convalescent Plasma Project with Mike and Nigel. And you can see by the end of the month, plasma was being used in the United States. And what had happened was that there was nothing you could do. And the media jumped on this and people began to put all kinds of applications to the FDA and the FDA couldn't have INDs in every single hospital. So they contracted Mayo Clinic with Mike Joyner and CPI to have the extended access protocol, which was to be a very significant part of the early effort. So uh, initial contacts created the leadership. I became chair because Mike made me chair without any consultation. Uh, who knows? I just became chair, but I want to point out some of these outstanding people. Well, you know, Nigel, three of these people will become uh, PIs on major studies. Lizanne will do the contained randomized clinical trial. Shmuel will do a prophylaxis a randomized clinical trial. Mike would do the PI extended access uh, program. And Jeff Henderson will bring in immunocompromise and Brenda Grossman taught us about transfusion medicine. I mean, we're a bunch of internists and one pediatrician. We didn't really know very much, but Brenda educated us and continues to educate us and was a, a force that makes sure that we didn't go off the rails. So the plasma project, this is the first thing it did was 
Nigel constructed a website, and this website now allows the downloading of protocols. Uh, originally, we had somebody from Sinai, but this individual left the group. So, so there have been three phases to CCP19. In 2020, it enabled the deployment of convalescent plasma. Nigel set up the website at MSU, the early protocols, the IRB applications, everything was distributed. You could go, you could click. And Nigel helped in the analysis of the AP data that would show safety and efficacy. In 2021, the shift that began to defending convalescent plasma. Um, and I will basically mention some of the analysis that it did. It created detailed critiques of flawed clinical trials. Uh, you find a clinical trial that is negative, you can go to our site and you can see why <laughs> we think the problem is. And then we also did our bad position papers. And in 2022, it's been more consolidation institute. Institu I can't pronounce it, but you can read it. Uh, we were, by then, three major societies recommended convalescent plasma and an allegiance, alliance with the AABB to promote CCP and ensure availability and a focus on immunocompromised patients. So this, in the summer, within a couple of months, one of the key questions was, is it safe? And this was shown to be safe. Uh, the first study was published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, a much larger study than was published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. This is Nigel's symposium, so you can see him on the line there. And then the question of efficacy. Well, uh, by the summer of 2020, uh, my joiner and the group had shown that there was, that there was, that if you give it early, you are less likely to die, consistent with everything we knew. But the most important from a scientific point of view was that he had a dose response. And a dose response in science, it's very strong evidence for a efficacy. And uh, this was presented in preprint form in the summer of 2020. Sadly, none of the randomized clinical trials took advantage of this data to modify. They basically went on and they plowed on to produce negative results in, 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 in 2021 in ways that, that were, I'm about to show you were terribly detrimental. Uh, this was eventually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then we ran into the politics, uh, which was a real problem in the, in the summer of 2020. In fact, CCP becomes the defender of the FDA. And here is a Wall Street, another Wall Street op-ed in which Nigel and I write uh, to try to reconcile what's going on and, and, to, and to defend the decisions that were made. Convalescent plasma use in the United States rises rapidly with the cases. So we went from zero in March to 20,000 units per week in the fall. And that is a tribute to the blood bankers who were able to go from essentially nothing to produce this uh, and be available to the American public, anyone who needed it within a couple of months. So um, this is an epidemiology symposium. This is work that Nigel was very much involved on. One of the things that we did was we knew the usage and we knew the mortality. And what you can see is strong inverse correlation between use and mortality in the United States. The more plasma was given, the fewer the death just like a smoking type of study. And from there, you can calculate that it saved 100, about 100,000 lives in the first year of the pandemic. But things will, the triumph will turn to tragedy. Uh, what you can see is the usage dropped rapidly. Three randomized controlled trials not done in the United States report no benefit. And these randomized controlled trials give it differently than it, or doctors are giving it, or doctors are using it right. They're giving it on admission. Mm -hmm. This are, is all late usage, but the randomized trials have such a, uh, a grip on the medical thinking that there is a rapid drop in usage. We can estimate that there were 37,000 extra deaths in three months uh, as a result of this. And this was a sovereign, and it shows you how much work we got to do uh, in, to, in medical training. In the winter of 2020, get, uh, convalescent plasma gets a second look. So what happens? Well, Omicron takes out the monoclonals. 
most monoclonals, and today they're all practically all gone. Uh, the two Hopkins randomized controlled trial, which is now done in outpatients, which is now done early, provides unequivocal evidence of efficacy. I'll show you some of that data. Immunosuppressed patients uh, present new therapeutic issues. It turns out that the immunosuppressed often can't clear this virus. The B cell depleted half this virus for a year. And based on the, on the need and on the Hopkins data, the FDA allows our patient use and the IDSA recommends uh, this is in the winter of 2022. And what you can see, the other thing that happens is a, we get a break. And that is that the people who have COVID and get vaccinated or get vaccinated and they have COVID mount such high titers of antibody that the antibody now neutralizes everything. In fact, it's fascinating from an immunological point of view because it means that, for example, if you have, if you have vaccines and Delta, you make antibodies that neutralize Omicron. Uh, this is a complex result of the diversification of the immune response, but it is a break because now the country is awash with high quality plasma that was not available in 2020. This is the Hopkins outpatient trial, the largest outpatient. By the way, this when people did the easy studies, they did it in the hospital. And part of the tragedy here is that they tested it in conditions when it could not work and then concluded that it did not work. Uh, but if you read history, you know that antibody therapies work early. And David Sullivan went through the trouble of setting up an outpatient protocol and the, he had a 54 reduction in hospitalization if uh, given early. And within six days of the public announcement of this data, the FDA allowed outpatient use. Convalescent plasma roller coaster. In 2020, it is up, rapidly deployed. 40% of all the patients are treated by the fall. Over half a million people are treated in the United States alone. The Mayo Clinic expanded protocol produces clear evidence of efficacy and safety. 2021, randomized control produced mixed results. Negative evidence is favored over positive evidence. Plasma falls out of favor, use falls markedly. And initially, the NIH, WHO, and the ACA recommended against plasma. Since then, the IDSA has reversed itself. In 2022, plasma is back up. Hopkins said patient trial shows efficacy. Omicron defeats most antibody therapies. The FDA modifies emergency use authorization to allow our patient use. The IDSA recommends it. But then there are, we find ourselves that just like war production has shut down, convalescent plasma collection had shut down and they were beginning to be in the, when it was most needed in the winter of 2022, when Omicron was running around the country with 3000 deaths, there was a real problem <coughs> with supply. But by March, the, the Red Cross is collecting again. So it, it finds a place. One of the things that CCP-19, it fights for convalescent plasma in the public domain. And you could see uh, in the nadir of its use in August 2021, as the Delta surge comes, the group is writing in MedPage today, the need to evaluate, to reevaluate this, that the negative trials don't, don't necessarily impact, don't necessarily negate its use. Uh, and then in 2022, we wrote this article on the Hill that was seen by all the politicians on how the FDA uh, saves thousands of lives. The FDA is one of the few institutions that works well during this pandemic. And there we are lucky that we have Peter Marks in charge of, of this uh, program uh, who has been uh, made sure that this was available from the beginning. And in June 2022, again, communicating with physicians how convalescent plasma finds a therapeutic role. The term numbers are looking forward. We met continuously since March, 2022, initially daily, then bi-weekly, and now we meet weekly, 9 p.m. Eastern time on Thursdays. We didn't meet last night because of the celebration. Over 40 publications have been authored by the leadership. Uh, the, the leadership has provided critiques on all the major clinical trials, and these are available. Five of opinion pieces in the general medical literature. And looking forward, 
our, we, our plan is continuing work to promote the proper use of CCP, making sure that the foibles of COVID are not repeated the next time. And we're also working on writing the history of this time because if we write the history, that becomes really important on how this gets perceived in the future. And my last slide, Convalescent Plasma has no profit, no industry, no patents, just altruistic donors, dedicated physicians, blood bankers, and a bunch of us kind of fighting guerrilla warfare. Uh, the efforts of CCP illustrate the can-do spirit and the self-association that the Tocqueville note in 1830 remain viable in modern American society. The CCP-19 organization doesn't happen in any of the other countries. It happens only in the United States. And I feel that we have made a major contribution to the fight against COVID, and we are very proud of what we have done. And thank Nigel for being a key member of this group. So with that, I'll stop sharing.